Well, First Christian, what a great time to be able to be together to praise God for who He is and for what He's done for us and what He continues to do. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and I'm glad that you are here today. Good to see you. hope you've had a good week. I uh, hope that you are uh, uh, drawing every day closer to what the Lord wants to create in your life and my life. Uh, it is a continual effort to grow uh, in our faith. Which leads me to what we want to do this morning, that is we want to go on with this series of messages. This is number three in the series, entitled Qualities That Equip Us for Life. Now we've already talked about two. The first week we talked about uh, that quality that uh, I called moral excellence. Uh, and then last week we talked about that quality that we called uh, spiritual discernment. Well today we're going to do two of them together because they are related uh, and to do one, you really need to do both of them. Uh, and those I'm calling uh, self-discipline and endurance. Now, what this series is all about really comes from the words of the Apostle Peter writing to Christians in his second letter, chapter 1, where he talks about those Christians and us need to add something to our faith. We're in Christ, we believe in Jesus, but there are things that we can do and we must do in order to really grow in our faith and if we do these things they will equip us make us profitable in this relationship with the Lord and will equip us to live life to the fullest which you remember that's what Jesus said he came to give that you might have life and have it to the full so let me read the text we're using the same text every week it is 2nd Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 11 Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness that's what we call moral excellence. And to goodness, knowledge. That's what we call spiritual discernment. And we come today. And to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let me give you uh, two very simple and brief definitions of our two qualities this morning. The first one is self-control. I think that pretty well explains itself. It's the ability to control ourselves, to say no to our desires that are wrong and yes to those things that uh, are good. Uh, the King James Version calls it temperance. Now, temperance is a good word, but the problem is we normally associate that with alcohol. And this is not just dealing with whether we use alcohol or not. This deals with all of ourselves, our ability to say no to control ourselves Today, for our message, I'm calling it self-discipline. The ability to be able to discipline ourselves to do what we need to do or not do, those things we should not do. And then the second word is perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to face difficulty and keep going. The ability to run the race with patience and to head on to finish strong to the finish line. I'm calling it endurance. So I would illustrate that by talking about maybe a marathon runner. Here is a man or a woman who's planning to run 26 miles. I can't imagine that. I never have liked to run. I get tired driving 26 miles. But to ride 26 miles, just beyond my imagination. But people just don't get up one day and say, I believe I'll become a marathon runner and run a race today. It takes tremendous discipline of self to train, to practice, to push yourself on and on and on. And then when the race starts, you got 26 miles and you got to keep on keeping on to the finish line. That's the kind of words we're talking about this morning. 
So we need to add to our faith self-discipline and endurance, and if we do it, it will make us effective in our relationship to Jesus Christ, and it will equip us to live in this broken, hurting world to the fullest of life. So, I want to make some observations about these two qualities, self-discipline and endurance. The first observation I make, this is a call for us to do the hard work of our faith. This is a call for us to do the hard work of our faith. Now you understand in many areas of life that you have to do some hard work. If you have a joint replaced, you've got to do the exercises. If you enroll in college, there will probably be some courses that you don't want to take, but you've got to take to graduate. If your family is growing, you may have to do a house renovation or get another house. And you go to the doctor, and he says your blood pressure is ridiculous and your sugar is off the chart. You've got to go on a diet. And we understand in the physical sense that there are times that there is hard work that we really have to do. We have to do it. And when we come to understand this matter of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to discipline ourselves and we have to keep on, even when the going gets tough. I just read an article in the paper this week. There is a fellow right now who is attempting to break the record of hiking the trails in the Smokies, over 900 miles, uh, and he's planning on doing it, I forget in how many days, it's some ridiculous amount. But they said he can't even eat enough to keep his weight up because he's burning so many calories, he just can't take in enough to keep his weight up. And I, I, that inspires me, not to go hiking, but just to realize that there are people who are willing to pay a pretty big price in order to endure, in order to keep going, to discipline themselves, to be able to be what they ought to be. Now that's important because I think too many people in this world quit too soon. They quit on their families because it got a little hard. They quit on their faith because things didn't go their way. And they quit on life. Some people do it because they just got sloppy throughout life and didn't take care of themselves. Some people do it because they want their own way. It's all about self and not about the kingdom of God. Some people do it because they just, uh, well, it's just too hard. You begin to think about this matter of endurance. You begin to think about this matter of self-discipline. You understand this is work. This is the hard work of our faith. Now, as an illustration of perseverance, this is our anniversary this week. Judy has persevered with me for 53 years. Maybe you would say she's endured it. And it's not always been easy. Those of you who are married understand what I'm saying. It's not always easy. But it's worth the effort. Now the truth is, in our Christian life, for some of us, there are some things that are easy. For instance, there are some people who find worship to be one of their greatest joys. They could worship for 12 hours straight. They, they could just spend a whole day praising God. There are other people who find Bible study. It just jazzes them. They could sit down at a desk and work for hours meditating and thinking about and researching and going through the scripture and just taking every little part. It's easy for them. And for some people, service is easy. They love working with people. They love working for the church. And, and they would just give their whole week, volunteer for everything they could. In other words, for some people, those three things that I'm using are easy. But what if they're not easy? What if worship is difficult for you or for me? What if Bible study is, is hard? What if, what if my mind wanders and I'm not naturally a reader? What if working with people is frustrating? Are, are those things right things to do? Do we not do them because they're not easy? Or does self-discipline determine that we're going to do what we need to do, whether it's easy or not? We're going to push on. We're going to run this race. We're going to do the hard work. Because, you see, we're adding it to our faith. I want you to listen to how the Apostle Paul describes his life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 24. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. 
Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Now, Peter says, make every effort. This is the hard work. This is what is necessary for us to be Christ followers. There was an ad back, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago on television, showed a guy doing a push-up and said, what if only one push-up was all you needed to be in shape? And then it showed a stalk of broccoli and said, what if only one stalk of broccoli is all you needed to be in shape? Well, folks, it's not that easy. We understand that being a Christ follower is not always the Sunday school picnic. We understand that being a Christ follower in this world sometimes is difficult. And we can choose to take the easy way or we can decide that we're going to discipline ourselves, say no to those things that are wrong, say yes to those things that are right, and we're going to live as we ought to live. We're going to be what we ought to be. We're going to practice enduring, running that race. Deidre, help me out. All right, thank you, Dee. I need a little help once in a while. And, <laughs> and we begin to think about this matter. Folks, the truth is, sometimes, you know, there's something in, in, in running, I'm told, that you hit the wall. What do you do if you're a runner? You quit or you push on through? See, if you were told that the Christian life is going to be one big happy church picnic, you were misled. Listen to the words of our Lord. You're familiar with them, Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus said, Deny self. There's that self-discipline. And take up a cross. Now, now, you understand that taking up a cross doesn't mean wearing a piece of jewelry. In Jesus' day, a cross meant capital punishment. And when a man took up his cross in Jesus' day, he was going to die. That's that concept again of dying to self. Because if we understand the Christian life, we're no longer in charge. It's not self, it's the Lord. And if he's the Lord, then he rules and he reigns. You see, we all have... We all have desires, uh, what the Bible sometimes calls the desires of the flesh, things that uh, we're kind of led to, things that we kind of maybe want to do. Do we do what God wants or what we want? You see, there are sins that some of us would think, well, I would never do that. But there are sins that are a part of our life, if we're not careful, that can kind of take over. And self-discipline, th this concept of self-control means that we learn to say no to the bad and yes to the good. I, I think that's why at the Lord's Supper, one of the things that we're told to do is examine ourselves. Are there things in my life, Lord, that are not pleasing to you? Am I, am I heading in a direction? Am I doing something? Do I have a habit that I'm so used to that I, I don't even think about it anymore? And I, I need to look within and examine myself. And somebody says, well, wait a minute, Drew, I believe. Do I have to behave? Absolutely. The Apostle Paul really liked athletic illustrations. Listen to what he says, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So this is, this is a call to do the hard work. In a physical sense, uh, I decided a long time ago that uh, I needed to continue to exercise. When I left Johnson and Judy and I started in ministry in 1968, uh, at Johnson, I'd played ball, I had worked out every day, and so I started in ministry, and all of a sudden I'm gaining a whole bunch of weight because I quit exercising. Well, I decided I didn't want to do that, so I started exercising and have all of my life 
When we first moved to Oak Ridge this past November, one of the first things I did was to join one of the local health clubs where I go regularly. What's funny is almost every time that I leave the house, Judy will say, have fun. And when I get there and I check in at the front desk, they take my temperature, and then they say, enjoy your workout. Well, now the truth is, sometimes it is not fun. And sometimes I don't enjoy it. So do I quit? Or do I endure? Do I say yes to my body, let's go home and have a big bowl of ice cream? Or do I say no to my body and yes to what I know is best for me, for my health? Do I endure? See, that's the issue we've all got to struggle with. That's my first observation. This is a call for us to do the hard work of our faith, not of our physical exercise. Second observation, to do the hard work, we need motivation and help. To do the hard work, we need motivation and help. So let's go back to see what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. He has talked to us already about what God has given us, and he's talked to us about how we can participate in the divine nature and how we can escape all the corruption in the world. And then he says in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 and 6, for this very reason, because of what God has done, because of what it will do for us. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, and we'll go on with the rest next week. Motivation. Now, you understand that adding to our faith this uh, moral excellence, what I'm calling it, and adding to our faith spiritual discernment, those things we've talked about over the last two weeks, will help us to be able to see what is right and what is wrong. It will help us to have this desire to be morally excellent, to do what's right. It will help us to have the vision to be able to see what's wrong. But here's the problem. It's not just knowing and seeing, it's a matter of doing. And so let's put these four together. So if I have a desire to be like God wants me to be, and if I have this ability to discern that this is wrong, this is right, then what has to happen is I have to discipline myself to begin to do what may not come natural and may not be fun and may not be comfortable. And I've got to keep on doing it, keep on enduring. It means we put into practice what we know is the right thing to do. Now, again, let me use a physical illustration. You understand it in the realm of the motivation for, for instance, If you've had a joint replaced, why do you want to do all those exercises? Because you want to walk. If you're taking class in college, why would you want to take a class you don't like? Because you want to graduate. If you've got a house, why do you want to renovate or move? Because you've got too many people living in one place and you're walking all over each other. And why in the world would you want to go on a diet? Because if you don't, you're going to die. And if you have that kind of motivation, then you begin to look for help. You might go to a therapist to help you with the exercise. You might take some extra courses to help you with that course that you're going to really struggle with. You may go on YouTube and figure out how to do a house renovation. And a diet? Oh boy, you need lots of help with that. You may listen to what the doctor says and begin to take his advice. So you're motivated to do something. So what What can motivate us in this matter of saying no to some of our desires that we really know are not good or not healthy? What can we what can we do? Well, listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 11. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. There it is. We want assurance. We want to know, Lord, are, are, are we okay together? Well, what Peter says, this, these qualities help us to know this. But then he goes on to say, For if you do these things, you will never fall. Another motivation. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you remember that even though the race is hard, there is a finish line. And when you cross that line, You hear this, well done, good and faithful servant. There's there's an old Christian song that says, Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning. Stick that on your mirror. So when you get up every day, you'll remember that there is a reason to press on. Hard? Yes. 
Frustrating sometimes? Yes. Difficult? Of course. But if you have this understanding of the motivation that God has already given to us all that we need for this Christian life, and he's with us, he's not left us, he's not forsaken us, and God is working all things together for the good of his people, and someday we cross that finish line if we keep running the race. Back up a little bit in 1 Peter chapter 5. Listen to what Peter says writing to Christians there, verses 8 and 9. He says, be self-controlled. There, there it is again. And alert. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. That's endurance. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You know, shared struggles motivate to know that whatever we're going through, we're not alone. Whatever temptation we're facing, there's others been tempted. Whatever tragedy we're going through, there are others have gone through this. We can understand this, this matter of shared suffering. But, but then we can, we can be motivated as we think about the cross. God loved us so much, he gave his son. We think about Jesus who, who endured the suffering of the cross for us. And the motivation is we keep our eyes on him and we keep our eyes on the finish line. Motivates us, moves us to want to try to do what maybe is very difficult. See, it should be the desire of all of us, no matter how old we are or how long we've been a Christian, to keep growing in our faith and to finish strong. That, that became one of my themes back several years ago in ministry. Uh, I, I want to finish strong. I may have to limp across the finish line, but I want to keep on, keeping on. There is that motivation. Okay, so, so I'm motivated, I want to do it, but what help is there for me? What, what can help me to keep on? What can help me to discipline myself? What can help me to endure even when it gets tough? Well, let's look again at what Peter says, Second Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power. Has, not will, but has already happened, given us everything we need for life and godliness. D did you get that? D don't miss it. You've already got it. The tools that I need and that you need to be able to overcome in this world has already been given to us by God Almighty. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Do you get that tool? So that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Folks, God provides what we need. He's provided his spirit within us, his church around us, his word for us, and his power above us. Only problem with tools is they're no good if you don't use them. But God has given us his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, the psalmist says, that I might not sin against you. He's given us a guidebook. He's given us a love letter. He's given us his Holy Spirit who is within us, who works with our spirit to confirm that we are children of God and to guide us and direct us. Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He's given us a wonderful gift of the church. I, I, I love, I love the body of Christ. Whether it's a few or a large number, I love the body. I love the mutual encouragement that we share together. It's a tool that God has given us to help us keep on. You see, one of the reasons we come together is so we can encourage one another. And all the more as we see the finish line drawing near. And so, as you begin to look at what God has done, because he loves you, there's motivation. And when you begin to look at what God has done because he loves you, you understand you've got the outward tools that God has placed within us. Now we decide, am I going to add to my faith? Because you see, it's our part. Peter says, make every effort. I've got a part here to add to my faith, self-discipline and endurance. One more observation, number three. This hard work is life-changing. This hard work is life-changing. I have known people, uh, a good many people, who have come up out of the baptistry, and from that moment on, they were just radically changed. 
uh, I mean, radically transformed. You could see, even their appearance looked different. But for most of us, it doesn't happen that way. Most of us, it's a continual process where God continues to sand on us and plane us and shape us and mold us to change our lives, to transform us into the very image of Christ. Peter says in verse 8 of our text that if we do these things, if you possess these qualities, 2 Peter 1.8, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's life-changing because we understand that when we became a Christian, we entered into a new relationship. We are now in Christ. And because we're in Christ, we're under new management. It's no longer self who's the king. It's the king of kings who is kings. And so our desire naturally should be that we want to do what our king says do. And we want to follow where our Lord says go. And that means sometimes having to say no to some of our own desires. We begin to understand that, as Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a, he's a new creation. Jesus indicated it was such a radical thing, he called it a, a new birth. It's life-changing because we practice what we say. And we live like who we are. Not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. He says, it says you were taught in regard to your former way of life. To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil, desi deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Did you see that? To be like God. Now, now that's not in power. That's not in knowledge. We're not going to be like God in that way at all. He is God. But it does mean that we'll be like Him in our lifestyle. We will seek to be holy because He is holy. Do you see how, do you see how these two qualities are life-changing? We, we understand through this matter of our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we understand that there are things that are right or wrong. So we have this, this ability to spiritually discern. You know what it is. You do something and, and it's almost like somebody whispered to you that really wasn't the right thing to do. Or you're thinking about some decision and, and you hear this prompting. I believe the Holy Spirit prompts us sometimes and, and, and you're thinking, well, maybe I, need to, maybe I need to look a little harder at this decision. Maybe, maybe I'm being very selfish here. Or maybe, maybe this is not good for me or good for my family. And, and so we discipline ourselves to begin to seek out doing what's right. And we really have this desire to keep running the race. And so we set our eyes on things above and we run this race with the desire to finish strong for the Lord who's loved us and blessed us. Let me give you an Old Testament illustration of a fellow who practiced self-discipline and endured. His name is Moses. You remember the story of Moses. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt. He was 80 years old when God called him to begin doing his work. 80 years old, folks. Some of us are getting closer and some of us can relate to that. But listen to what the Hebrew writer says about Moses. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Hang on to that. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered. Because he saw him who is invisible. Can you open the eyes of your heart? I love that song, Ross. Thank you. Open the eyes of your heart to see he, the one who is invisible. Maybe to see what Hebrews 12 talks about is that, that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. Cheering us on, I believe. Keep on! 
Keep on. Don't quit now. Keep on. And when you hit that wall, that rough time that's hard, so hard, you keep your eyes on the finish. But more than that, you keep your eyes on the one who has gone ahead and already finished the race, our Lord Jesus Christ, and who's waiting to welcome us across the finish line. Jesus said one time, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, it's not enough just to believe. We do have to behave. It's not enough just to know the right thing. We're to do the right thing. It's not enough just to start the Christian life. We've got to endure to the finish. Then, my friends, as we practice self-discipline, and as we endure, we will be equipped to live this life for as long as God lets us and to live it to the full. Anybody never made that decision to follow Christ? It's a decision. It's a decision if you have not made that decision, you can make today to decide that you want to enter into this relationship with Jesus. To know that His grace is far greater than any sin you've committed. To know that His blood will cover and remove your sin now and forever. To know the hope of life, real life today. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to sing about deciding to follow Jesus. And if you've never made that decision, you can do it today. I'll be here at the front. Uh, other elders, staff will be around. We'll be glad to talk to you and help you with that. Come ready to confess before people. I, I'm ready. I believe in Jesus, and I, I'm putting my trust in him. And I'm going to turn away from stuff that I know is wrong, and I'm going to be baptized for the washing away of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to begin this race. You see, you've got to start the race. But, but most of us here have already done that. Something else you need to do to train yourself for godliness Something you need to quit or give up that uh, you know is not helpful, you know is hurting you, hurting others. Good time to decide to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you've set out for us a course of a race to run. Help us to run well. And help all of us to finish strong. I pray, Father, that on those times when it's discouraging or difficult or hard or when, when we just get overwhelmed, would you, would you help us? Please help us, Father, to keep on. And I pray, Father, that when we struggle with certain areas of life that we might remember we're not alone. But you've equipped us. You've given us the help we need. And surely you've given us the motivation we need. So I pray that we might be in all things faithful servants of you, our God, our Father. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.